Hey everybody, it's Jason Bloha here, and once again it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. Alright, first question. Jason, I am 5'10 and struggling to gain weight on 3,700 calories while running Ice Cream Fitness 1.0. I currently weigh in about 130 pounds. I track my calories every single day according to the nutrition labels on the food. My lifestyle is pretty sedentary. Why am I not gaining weight? Do I have a serious disease or something? Um, I'm going to take you at face value and I'm going to say if you are 100% certain that you are consuming this sort of caloric intake, and I mean you're not messing up labels, you're actually weighing, and, and you know that you're consuming that much, and you have a sedentary lifestyle outside of training, and you weigh 130, yes, you very possibly have a very serious medical condition. Now, I don't want to freak you out, uh, but it may be a case of serious mismeasurement. It could be a case of you might have only been doing this for a week. Right? You might have only been doing this for a week and your scale hasn't caught up. Um, and you're going to see it like a 10-pound weight jump in the next couple of weeks or something due to water weight, everything else. But here's what I'm going to say. Generally speaking, just the additional carbohydrates and sodium from doing an intake like that had you been on something like 2000 or 2500 or whatever you should start seeing substantial water weight gain immediately all right the fact that you're 130 that's very underweight i'm not sure your exact height uh you need to go in and, and see a medical doctor and and i don't want to make you panic but if you're legitimately serious no joking no trolling this is one of those cases to where when, when your calories versus your body weight are extremely disproportionate, whether it's one extreme or the other, in your case, not gaining weight, um, you might be a type 1 diabetic, right? That's actually something I would place as one of the possibilities. And you're just expelling the calories out because we cannot get around calories in, calories out. It's completely impossible. But what happens is that this is a case of calories in, calories out, right? And if that's what's going on, like with something like type 1 diabetes, you are excreting excessive amounts of ketones and sugar in your urine and everything else. And so you need to get in and see a medical doctor to be sure, because this is mathematically not how any of this is going to work. And this is not even a case of people who are different. This is usually a sign of a very, very serious medical issue This this potentially life-threatening. This This could kill you. So you need to get in and get tests run. Or you need to double check and make sure that you're doing this correctly. You're actually weighing everything right. You're measuring right. And that it hasn't just been a really short period of time. Now, if this has been going on for three or four weeks, yeah, you need to get in and see a doctor right now. This is a, a warning sign, a major warning sign. All right, next question. I've built up to being able to do weighted pull-ups for a 5x5 five five with 75 pounds. When I went on holiday, I brought my weight belt with me and the hotel gym only had 35 pounds of weights uh, to you, so I decided to do 5x10. However, this kicked my butt. I couldn't even complete three sets of 10 with that weight. I ended up finishing the last two with body weight. Uh, why is that? Is this normal? I thought my strength would carry over to the higher rep range. Thanks. Your strength you carry over to the higher rep range. This is the problem we run into. Pull-ups are body weight plus weight, right? Don't get caught up in this idea of how much plates you have hanging because it's not the same. In other words, a 300-pound guy who does a 10-pound dumbbell is stronger than you, okay? Even though he's only got 10 pounds on there. All right, you've got to remember these are percentages of your max. Your max for a body weight exercise is your body weight plus the, the plates being added for a single or even for, for your rep work, right? So let's say you weigh 180 pounds, right? You can do five by five, maybe pushing it all out with about 85% of your max, okay? Let's say you weigh 180 pounds. That's going to put your max at about a 300 pound pull up, assuming you weigh 180. And you can do a full range of motion five by five, about 300. Well, 35 pounds, if you were to take oh, the 180 and add that to it, that's 215. That's 215. That's just over 
seventy percent of a one of a one rep max is about a ten rep max. Like you think you're going to do your ten rep max for five sets? No, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. So you got like one good set of ten, maybe two sets of ten, and that's it. You were completely done. Right, your 10 rep max isn't doable for multiple sets of 10. Just like your true 1 rep max isn't doable for multiple singles. You're going to you're going to run out of steam. So I think what you've got to remember is that maybe you were thinking that 35 pounds was 50% of your normal working weight. It wasn't. It wasn't. Right? It was only about a 10% difference. It's only a 10% difference. Is there any other lift that you can think of to where you do sets of five and you reduce the weight by, by 10% and you can do the same number of sets of 10 that you do sets of five? Probably not. Probably not. It was just a math issue. It's just you, you, you've miscalculated the percentage of your wonder at max because you didn't factor in that it's body weight plus the weights, right? Even though that applies to things like squats and deadlifts for such a smaller amount of the percentage, we don't, we don't factor them in the same. That's what's going on. All right, next question. What's your take on Eddie Hall advising people to deadlift only from the floor up to the knees and forget about the lockout? His argument is that most strong men can pick up a yoke or other load that is significantly heavier than their deadlift and that the lockout is essentially a hip thrust and you have the power to do it. Does it only apply to people who already have a massive strength base or would it apply to everybody? In my experience, taking the load from, from big, heavy shipping boxes uh, from thigh height to hip, carry, height to carry it or shelving it is the hardest part. However, a two-foot wide box uh, with 150 pounds doesn't have the same challenge as locking a barbell. All right. Good question. And here's what people need to remember. This is why I tell people some of these genetically gifted freaks who never even learn basic training protocols to get somebody strong come up with ideas like this. They come up with ideas like this. This is not going to work in the real world for other people. And here's why. He's basically telling you to decelerate on a deadlift. All right? I'm already not a fan of paused deadlifts. I know they're popular, but I'm going to say for the overwhelming majority of lifters, you're going to get weaker doing paused deadlifts than you would actually doing a deadlift. Why? You're training yourself to decelerate. And he's saying, well, because we are so much stronger at the lockout that we get other training with that, we only need to train the hardest part. We come over to the point of you're doing partial reps. And granted, as partial reps do the hardest part, you're losing a lot of, of muscle fiber recruitment. But the main thing is that you'd be training yourself to decelerate. How many other coaches out there specialize so much in training rate of force production? Especially if they work with power lifters and field athletes. Force production, force production, force production. It's everything. We spend so much time, including even me, focusing on the exact opposite of everything that he just said. Why? Because we're, we're not genetically gifted. All right? We're not on 10 grams of gear. All right? You need to take someone like Eddie Hall. A guy like Eddie Hall with an enormous frame, extremely genetically gifted for strength, probably uses amounts of anabolics that would kill a horse, kill an elephant. And that's an exaggeration. For, that's hyperbole for those who don't understand that. Uh, it's going to give you advice on something that is so rudimentary and understood in strength and conditioning. But because he's so big and strong, people might take it to heart and realize it's actually really bad advice. And his logic is extremely flawed with it. Yes, he's right in that you should be able to lock out more weight than you pull from the bottom. But you get fatigued pulling from the bottom. And the worst thing you could do is decelerate. Intentionally decelerating is going to recruit less muscle fibers. Right? Now, when you're his size and you're doing all sorts of dozens of e enormous massive lifts that other human beings will never touch, and you're eating massive amounts of food, so much food that you become enormously, ridiculously, disgustingly fat, like he does, and you use more anabolics than, you know, five or ten of your local gym bros put together, of course you're going to keep getting big and strong doing even stuff like that. It doesn't matter. Plus, he's all around strong already. 
this is not going to work for you. It's not going to work for the average person. You are going to gain less muscle and less strength doing something like this. You just are. Not saying you won't make gains, but it will be less. It's just bad advice. So again, be careful when you go to these genetic freaks who are on massive amounts of substances because they're massive or they're strong that not every bit of training advice that they have is actually good, well thought out, or anything that any good coach would recommend. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.